Sweet. Um, are there any students here? All right, awesome. I didn't think there'd be that many. Uh, any academia? Uh, per, anyone that works in a school, professors, um, advisors, adjuncts, adjuncts count, sure, my book. Um, sports staff, yeah, absolutely. I play lacrosse, I like sports. Um, all right, cool, so today, um, our goal, so I gave this talk at DEF CON with a guy named Ted. Uh, we did a lot of this work together, so he couldn't make it here, so I'm gonna be giving it for the both of us. Um, so our goal is we want every university to participate in cyber competitions. Um, we're going to help you help us reach that goal, and we're going to int introduce a few ways that you can gain some knowledge. And we have a tool that's going to help you get started, and we're going to tell you how to use it um, and how to contribute to it and what it can do for you. Um, so the first time I gave... Am I, am I too low? Is that better? Oh, not loud enough? Is that good? Can you guys hear me? Is it too low? Good? All right. Sorry, thank you. All good. Um, right, so I'm going to show you how to create a uh, successful university cyber defense program, I think, right? Um, so real quick, the, the Who Am I slide that everyone has. My name's Mike. Um, I'm a student at Stevens. I live in Hoboken, New Jersey, right, uh, right by New York City. I work in New York City at ISAC Partners. Uh, if anyone's ever heard of it, it's a consultancy. I'm a security consultant there. Um, I lead the Steven Cyber Defense team, and that's my Twitter. Right? I just got into the Twitter game not that long ago, so be sure to follow me. Right? So the outline is first I'm going to talk about how to get educated. So I gave the talk at DEF CON, and it was really like, I gave the talk, and it was a lot about like once you start competing, what do you get out of that? What can you do once you've competed? Uh, and a lot of people in the questions room were asking, like, all right, I have a whole bunch of friends at my school. How are we going to get educated? Like, how do we do this? How do we get to that level where we can compete? So I added that in to the slideshow. So hopefully that helps you out. How to start competing once you are educated. So why you should compete in cyber competitions, what you can do in, with cyber competitions, uh, what you should look for when you're doing, what you can really get out of it. Uh, how to compete effectively and collaboratively. So me and two of my friends wrote some software. So if anyone's ever heard of AppJet's Etherpad, it's what Google Docs is based off of. So we took, uh, we took that engine and we edited it. And I'll show you all that later. And we created like um, a CTF machine to help you compete in CTFs. And then once that, once we've outlined the problem and the solution, where do you go from there, right? So once you have, once you know how you can get to that point, once you know what you should be looking for, and once you, once I give you the software to help you do that, uh, where do where do we move forward from there? So let's outline the problem, right? Universities try to teach you how to be hackers, and everyone in academia knows this, and all students know this. Um, you're not going to learn how to hack in like automata and computation or theoretical computer science. And those are really important, but like if, you're, if you want to be a consultant, or you want to be a pen tester, you want to compete in CTFs, uh, you're not really going to learn it that much in that class. Now, a lot of schools offer information assurance classes, but uh, most of the times in those classes, they're so high level. And um, a lot of times instructors have never really been in the industry, or they're really, I, I know at my school, they're all from Bell Labs, and they, all they know about is like cryptography, and that's all they care about. So we don't get to learn any of those uh, really cool things that we could use in CTFs or anything, so that's a big problem, right? And not all universities have a cyber lab, and um, the ones that do, since there's no like standard and there's no like great documentation on that, uh, most schools are just rolling their own. And, um, and fear, right? So a lot of kids are afraid uh, to compete in cyber competitions because they're afraid of getting owned, which is legitimate. Uh, so about that problem, school doesn't teach you much practical knowledge, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you need an outlet for practical learning. Like, you've all heard that before. I'm not telling you anything new or revolutionary. Um, so you want to learn things in school and gain practical knowledge. That's what a lot of people's complaints are, especially people that come to conferences like these. Uh, so there's a few solutions, right? Uh, so the first one is students teaching each other. So this is student-ran cyber defense education groups, which is what we have at Stevens. And what it is is students run the classes and teach each other. They're really in a formal. Um, and it basically consists of a student, uh, it's been me for the past couple years at Stevens, so I'll get, uh, so for example, like I'll, if I wanna teach about uh, web hacking, uh, so I'm primarily an application penetration tester, so that's not that difficult. So I'll get up there and I'll uh, prepare slides and then I'll have like 40 or 50 students from the school come 
and I'll teach them, and it's fun, and uh, we all learn a lot, and it's really cool. Um, so all you need is really motivational stu motivated students. So you need a motivated student or students to be the ones teaching the lessons, and you need motivated students to be able to put that time in outside of classes, right? Uh, you don't really need infrastructure, you don't really need money. Um, if you're crafty, you can get by using VMs and MSDNAA accounts, the Academic Alliance ones. Those are free. Everyone in school probably knows about those. They're really sweet. So you don't really need much out of it. Uh, what you get out of it is, is it's, uh, it's not that hard to get going, and it gives students a chance to like, be really motivated and take initiative and really show that they're really earnest in learning and all that. Um, what you don't get out of it is that a lot of times, if so, a lot of schools like want to start learning about exploitation, right? But a lot of times students don't know about exploitation, and it's really difficult. And not all of us live in New York where there's all your Dino Daisobis and Charlie Millers around. So uh, it gets pretty difficult, and it has the ability to die out fairly quickly. So if you compete in competition and you get uh, owned, it can be really de demotivating. Um, so now the next thing you can do uh, probably the better solution is to enlist help from professionals, right? So there's a few really good information security classes that exist. And luckily for everyone else, arguably the best one keeps all its course material really public and open. And that's, um, so does anyone here know Dan Guido? Does anyone here? Uh, awesome. So Dan Guido's a really cool guy. Um, I don't want this to seem like a pitch because I work at ISEC Partners. I did all, I just started there like a month ago. So all this research was done before I started working there. Um, but he's a senior consultant at ISEC. He graduated NYU Poly a few years ago, and he teaches the pen testing and vulnerability assessment class at NYU. And what it does is, and what's really unique to that class, um, is it covers the entire life cycle. So he starts out with how to identify vulnerabilities and everything from web applications, binaries, source code, um, and goes through all the steps on how to, uh, how to exploit them. And he has a ton of uh, guest speakers come in, and I'll go get to them more later. Uh, so what you need for that is basically, the website for that class is pentest.cryptocity.net, and uh, it's already there for you. He has all his classes and all his videos and all his material and all his hands out. Um, they're all up there, so if anyone wants to copy that down. I'll, I'll post these slides uh, somewhere. I'll tell you where later. Uh, so you don't have to, there's going to be more links later, so you don't have to worry about copying them down too free virtually. Um, so what you get out of it is lecture videos and materials from some of the brightest people in the industry, right? So he has people like Dino Daisovi, Alex Sodorov uh, teaching like exploitation reversing, Aaron, Port Aaron Portnoy, Dr. Rate of ZDI teaching uh, reversing, Joe Hemler from GDS Security um, teaching web hacking. He's had Eric Abedis, Dean DeBeer, like all these huge, huge, huge people um, like teaching these classes for these kids. And it's, really, it's a really great uh, opportunity. If you're in New York, he doesn't mind people stopping by. Uh, and he posts all that on, the web, on his website. So nothing, it, he doesn't use like Moodle or eLearn or any of those pieces of software. Everything's open, everything's free. Um, what you don't get out of it is basically the only thing you don't get out of it is that it sucks that you can't actually be there. Because I've, like, I've been to a ton of them even though I don't go there. And like, they're, they're, it's a really great uh, place. So I put some links here. So when I send this out, you can copy those. So he has really great links for careers. So if you're a student interested in information security, he outlines like five areas of which you could work. Uh, CTFs, which is an awesome link, which he has a ton of videos and information on CTFs. Uh, the outline of the course, I was going to list like all the actual links to each part of the course, but it would have took up too much space. So if you go to the syllabus, you can see all the different areas that he focuses in in the course. And he has a forum, uh, he has his own Reddit for the class, and his Twitter where he puts updates. So if you want to go ahead and follow that, you can get some good information out of that. Um, so now, I'm going to assume that you're going to take that information, go back to your school, use that, propagate that knowledge, and now you know things, right? So now you're a genius. Uh, so you've learned all about information security. Um, why don't you like, so now you're going to go and do it. So you're, but you have a few options, uh, but I'd say your best option is to participate in cyber competitions. So why do you want to participate in cyber competitions? They're a practical out outlet for your real world knowledge, and they help you assess your current skills and help you realize what skills you need to work on more. Um, but if you never participate in competitions before, they can be pretty difficult. And uh, you start off thinking you're a big dog, and then you get pwned by a little cat. Um, so why do we care that competitions are hard? Or better yet, why is it important that competitions are hard? Uh, remember our goal, we want all students to participate. So. Uh, 
competitions introduce students to critical thinking, right? So we want to start using competitions to augment assessment. So competitions, if, so just a quick show of hands, how many people in this room have uh, competed in a CTF? Right, so a good amount of you. So you know like you can learn a lot from a CTF and if you have a class on like exploitation and then at the end of the semester your professor gives you uh, an exploitation CTF, uh, it's a really good application of your knowledge to see how much you actually learn. So I think, or we all think, um, that using competitions to augment assessment is a really solid way to get through to that. Um, and you can also evaluate your curricula with competition. So if you want to see if a class is really effective and see if it's really working, give all the students in that uh, a competition as opposed to not. It's a really good way for um, studies to go about, right? But competitions are still hard. So how do you make competitions less hard? Uh, so you can standardize challenge scoring, right? So instead of barking for a form of, uh, of the education system, let's look at the situation. Now we already have uh, really awesome cyber competitions, so let's instrument them and do, it, do this ourselves. So uh, standardized challenge scoring, such that you have a standard way of scoring challenges based on how difficult they are. So a lot of different competitions, a lot of different CTFs. I was just talking to some guys that did the DerbyCon CTF, and they were, um, they were talking about, like they were really upset that someone solved their challenge because they, like, made it as difficult as they can. And that's not really the point of CTFs, right? The point of CTFs is for you to get a challenge, uh, figure out how to do it, instrument your exploit, and really like take something from both the vulnerability analysis and the exploitation of it. Uh, it's not to make whoever wrote the competition look super elite and super awesome. Um, it's for you to actually learn something. So how do you how do we get to that point? So we can make a tiered structure to competition. So almost like, if anyone's familiar with NCAA sports, like there's your D3, D2, D1, uh, you can almost make this like an actual collegiate sport, right? So have cyber defense and cyber attacking be an actual collegiate sport and really use that. Um... Sorry, I was thirsty. Um, really use that to augment your assessment, which is pretty cool. Uh, so, but the main thing you can do to make competitions less hard is you can practice, right? Uh, so one thing we have to do is standardize and systemize our practice. So we need a set way and a set thing to look for uh, when we're practicing. So the first thing you have to look for is you want to remove a fear of the unknown. So you're going to go into a CTF, and the point of a CTF is that you're not aware of what's going to happen, and you're not really sure. Um, so you have to be prepared to redefine your objective, right? You have to be in it to learn, not just to win. And that's one thing that a lot of people don't really take out of CTFs that I really feel like you should. Um, you're in, you play a CTF to win, yeah, but you play it to learn and get a lot out of the challenges, like I said before. Uh, so you want to change your motivation in order to change your outcome. So uh, standardize and systemize, right? So you want to build competition goals. Um, you want to highlight collaboration. Like these are all things that you, your outcome should be when you're participating in a competition. Uh, so you want to build your goals uh, beforehand. You want to highlight collaboration. So CTFs are all about working together and getting things done as a team. Uh, you want to track your progress and inter-team development. Uh, and compare your results from competition to competition. Now um, that's all good and great, but is there a tool to help? So can anyone think of a tool that you can use um, to help collaboration and participation in CTFs. Excuse me? Armitage. Armit you're right. Okay, you can use Armitage. Anything else? So now I'm talking. I'm not. Uh, I'm talking like if me and you are working on a, a challenge together. How can we remotely collaborate on that? Excuse me. Skype. Okay, Skype. So we can talk to each other. But what about how do we share our work? Well, I guess we can share our desktops, but. Right, so there's, there's a few. There's Breadmine and MediaWiki, and those are kind of slow, and there's a lot of syntax overhead and versioning conflicts. Um, right, right, so there's Google Docs, which is pretty good, but a little feature lacking, right? So that's pr really good for sharing text and all that. And if you wrote some tools or utilities or scripts or you reverse engineered something, you can toss it in Google Docs. Um, but they're all pretty good, but they're all lacking a little bit, right? Uh, so Google Docs isn't perfect. It doesn't give you everything you could want uh, when going through a CTF. So like good computer scientists, what did we do when we couldn't find a solution? We made our own. So, uh, so enter rock, uh, RTFN, Rock the Flag Network. So what it does is it, um, it's, a so it's a software hardware collaboration, tracking, storage, et cetera solution. And uh, it organizes pre and post competition data. So let's say it's like the third year that you've competed in a competition. 
every year you've gone through it, you've learned a little more, right? So everyone really competes in like ICTF and uh, Seesaw CTF. So every year going into it, you know a little bit about what the competition is going to be about. And if you're using RTFN for several years, you'll be able to data mine all that information such that when you start to compete in a competition, you'll really have a good idea about what to expect and what to get out of it. And it's, re it's also really good for, um, for new people coming in because you can say, hey, if you're not sure if you want to compete in this competition, come over, look at what we have, look at what it's been like before, and then you can really assess if this is the competition that you want to start with or compete in. Um, it's got an integrated local repository of tools, so similar to how Backtrack has their, uh, has their whole tool store, uh, the ISO has a lot of stuff like that too, which is really sweet. So I, I know a lot of times in competitions, like last year there were like four consecutive competitions where I needed Pad Buster, and uh, I had to go and download it every time. So I had to go find out where it is, go and download it, and waste all that time doing that when I could have just had it. Um, uh, also, you have real-time challenge management, which is where we pull uh, AppJet's Etherpad from. So we've edited uh, AppJet's Etherpad to have like a nice uh, challenge dashboard uh, that really shows you like color-coded ways of what, what, who's working on what, what's, what's not being worked on, what's the status of different challenges. Um, so that's really cool. I'll show you that later. Uh, reporting and trending, which I, I have some graphs on here that I'll show you. And uh, that's really cool. So you can see how you do over time. <laughs> what different things uh, you work with over time and all that, so it's pretty cool. And it also enables, enables involvement, right? So how many times have you competed in a CTF for like 48 hours and you all kind of just sat in one room? Like it happens all the time. I know I've done it a ton of times before. And it's really tough because a lot of times, like if you, especially if you have a big campus, uh, certain people like want to go back to their rooms or it's getting really late or you want to go back to your room and like you're about to go back uh, to bed and you want to work on some stuff or you can't always, out, um, can't always make it to the same place. Or especially I know that now, uh, now that a lot of my friends graduated, I have a little CTF team that competes in a bunch of things and we're all over the country. So there's some of us in Delaware, I'm in New York, uh, some of us are in New Mexico, some of us are in California. So this enables us to really work on something as if we were all there with each other uh, with the help of like Skype and other like Ventrio and other voice stuff. So, I made a little, everyone loves flowcharts, right? So I made a little flowchart. Awesome, I love that thing. Uh, so it shows you input, your input to RTFN is uh, the challenges, the tools, the dates and deadlines, and obviously you. And on the bottom you have all the things that RTFN gives you, and your output is what you get is uh, camps involvement. Uh, you're, you're able to identify your weaknesses. Uh, you can trend your challenges and you can prepare more effectively. So to look at, um, identifying weaknesses, you can look at, so I have a graph, right? Um, so if you look at time one, it shows that it's taking you about between like 90 minutes and 120 minutes, so it's about an hour and 45 minutes to compete web challenges. And then when you go to time two, you drastically drop. So what changed in that point? Uh, so you have all those challenges and then you dr dramatically drop your time to participate those. So you can diff all your tags, so when you, do a comp uh, when you do a challenge, you tag it with the tools you use, with who does it, et cetera. And uh, so you can do tags one null, and tags two, you use burp. So when you use burp proxy, you really get a lot more out of it, and your times drop, so that's pretty sweet. So for this one, if you look at time one over here, uh, minutes to solve binary analysis, you're doing it pretty, pretty consistently at around a half an hour. And then at time two, uh, you jump up to almost an hour and a half. Um, and then back at time three, you go down. So what was the difference between that? So you have your editor, when Nick was doing your, uh, your binary analysis challenges, you were solving pretty consistently in about a half an hour. And then uh, once Bob comes in, it shoots up. So you know Bob sucks and you need to keep using Nick. Um, so now I have a bit of a demo that I'm gonna show you guys, which is pretty cool. So, So we have an instance of, we actually competed in a competition yesterday that I didn't get to compete in. So uh, I'm gonna show you some stuff from that. So you log in, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna check out this one, which was a competition we did the last week. So this is your dashboard. So you can create a new challenge. You have all the challenges you created already. Then you have all your solved ones down here. You can, I don't know if you can see the colors that well on that screen, but uh, like these are kind of like a yellowish and these are green. So you can click into, uh, like this one is a reverse engineering one. So these are just notes. If anyone else is in there, you can chat. 
and send them something, and it tells you all the users that are in there. You can tag that as solved or hard. And when you go back, it'll stay that way. All right. Um, oh, that was the one we were just in. So that's pretty cool. So you can have all these, so you can, you can log these and you can keep these there. So yesterday we competed in our WTHCTF. So we have all, like you can create your, uh, one for your information. You can have a ton of stuff there. And you can have all your data. That's a good looking guy. Um, so if you're writing code or anything, you can paste it in here. Uh, all your team information, all your challenges. So instead of working on Google Docs, so the reason why we have this is because a lot of times like you do all your work in a CTF in like a notepad file and like what happens with a notepad file when you go to sleep, someone else starts working on the competition and they start from scratch because they don't have your files, they don't have your information. So it really, if you encourage everyone to work in a, an etherpad, it really helps for that and it really helps so I can tag that so you'll see like Ted and Dan M were working on that one, Ted was working on that one. Uh, and you can tag competitions as you own them. So I know when I look at that challenge dashboard, when I walk into a competition room, I know who's working on what, and I know what's not being worked on. So if there was a competition that wasn't owned by anyone, then I would know, okay, like this needs to be worked on, and I would hop on that. So it takes a lot of time and a lot of questions out of actually effectively participating in them, right? So that's pretty cool. So I'm going to go back to here, right? So now you can implement it in a bunch of different ways. So this is something that uh, I made a few months ago, and it was—it's—I bought like a big aluminum box from uh, from like Home Depot, and I cut a bunch of like side, I cut a bunch of holes in it, and I made ports in it. And uh, I don't know if you can really see it that much on the side, on the left side there. There's like ports. One's blue and one's red. The red one doesn't do anything, but it just looks cool. Uh, and there's like a switch in there, there's a hard drive, and there's like a little mini computer. And basically, we can carry that around to a lot of CTFs, because a lot of them are on site, right? So the, like the finals of NYU Poly Seesaw CTF is in New York. So we can bring that with us and connect to that. We can use that uh, if we can't like have a remote connection out, we can bring that with us. So this isn't like how you have to implement it, but it's just a way you can show them. Like it's really lightweight, it's really versatile. Um, so you can do a bunch of really cool stuff with it. So why might RTFN make a difference? Um, so it enables team collaboration, which is cool. Uh, it's a tool for extracting metrics from competition. So one of the most important things about CTFs is what you get out of them. And you can't, like you can get as much as you want out of them, but if you're not logging that data and looking at how you're improving, you're really not getting anything out of it in the long run. So you can compare student performance with and without RTFN and see like, see how you improve and see like what your data score looks like over time. Uh, so if you want to know more, we wrote a white paper called RTFN enabling blah, 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 blah. And uh, that's published. You can Google that. Uh, you can email me for that and I'll send it to you. It's like a seven or eight page white paper about RTFN and all the components that go into it. And it's more, way more detailed about that. Um, if you want to know where you can get it, there's a beta version of the software at rocktheflag.net. Uh, and you can go there and it redirects to our source forge and you can go and download it. So that's the, uh, that's the etherpad only. So you can get that and you can install it. And as far as what's coming soon, we're going to be releasing the ISO soon. And that'll have everything integrated and it'll be totally headless. So you can go and just stand that up on a server and it'll have like a bunch of cool stuff for you guys to mess around with. And uh, we're going to start helping other schools uh, run CTFs too. So if you need advice on what to put into your CTF, uh, what are you trying to get out of it? Um, if you need help writing challenges or anything, you can shoot us an email and we'll help you out with that. And uh, so what can you do to help? So the most important thing you can do to help us is to use it and give us feedback. So if you use it and you see something you don't like, uh, see something that you think you would need. So now this year for the first time, for example, um, most of my team is uh, spread across the country. So we realized we really need a better solution for talking to each other. So Skype's not really cutting it. So we need to like roll our own like voice chat solution into this. So that's something that we realized because that was a new constraint put on us. So if you can, um, if you use it and you see anything like that, let us know. If you want to contribute ideas, awesome. If you want to contribute code, even better. So you can go and check that out and uh, contribute whatever you want to it. Uh, so what should you take away from this? So all students should be participating in competitions 
and uh, competitions can augment university curricula. So for the people in academia, if you want to start uh, instrumenting competitions into your classes, it's a really effective way to see like what your students are actually learning and how effective your teaching actually is. Now, if you don't agree with us, you can still use RTFN for uh, playing current cyber competitions or uh, remote red teaming. So we talked to a few people uh, from CCDC uh, who were on the red team, and uh, we presented this in Vegas uh, like three months ago, and they came up to us and they were like, hey, like, this isn't only useful for CTFs. Uh, as red teamers for competitions, we also need something like this. So if you want to, instead of creating a, um, like a challenge pad thing for uh, for like a challenge, you can do okay. I own these like these teams with this exploit. Like log that, and uh, creates like really you can really you can use that for uh, red teaming too. And it's all open source, so you can just go edit whatever you want to it if you want to make it look different or uh, act different. So so I went through that really quickly. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions or anything I like blew over through quickly? Yeah? So absolutely, so let me just go back a little bit. So if you go to pentest.cryptocity.net, that's uh, the link to Dan Guido's class. He teaches the class at Poly on um, penetration testing and vulnerability assessment. So if you go there, uh, there's, I put up a few links. So if you go to the syllabus of that, it's a lot of re you get a lot of really cool links. You can watch all his videos. So he basically takes you. you need, when you walk into that class, you need a knowledge of like a, like a scripting language and hopefully some x86. And he starts from there and goes from source code analysis, exploitation, web hacking, reverse engineering, source code auditing. Um, so if you don't know anything and that's what you're and you're just you need a place to learn, that's a really cool place to go. So you can check that out. And uh, yeah, I'd say that's right now out of all the research I've done, looking for places to like show links and share links and stuff. That's the best place you can go to for that. Yes. That's information about CTFs right there. If you're looking for CTF ISOs and stuff like that, um, email me or talk to me after, and I'll talk to you about like where you can find like vulnerable ISOs and stuff like that, and stuff to hack at. And there's there's a if you go to the uh, slash capture the flag, you can find a calendar, and it has a calendar of uh, CTFs across the country. So there's always CTFs going on. So you can just hop on one of those. There's one like every week. Anything else? Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, it is, it's us at rocktheflag.net, so it's supposed to be like contact us, right, get it? <laughs> Pretty soon. Right. Um, so, so I do the same thing. So I run like study classes, and uh, like I teach a class at my school about that for students. It's a no credit class. It's just like an after school thing as a part of our like cyber defense organization. And that is a really hard thing to deal with, uh, trying to motivate people where they don't, they don't just want to be taught, but they want to like actively contribute. And a lot of them just don't know enough to actively contribute yet. Uh, and I'd say the best thing you can do is if you're someone that they look up to as like a source of their knowledge. Um, and you really want to propagate education in your school that, and you feel like it's not there, um, just continue to like educate them about that mindset and continue to show them that like this is something collaborative and it's not something that like I can just show you everything about. Like it's a give and take type thing. And all you can really do is continue to press that. There's no like magical formula now. Anyone else? Cool things. Yes, yeah, like of, of course. Um, the reason why like we don't do that is because like, in order for us to distribute that, uh, we'd have to obviously distribute like the same SSL certificate, which 
isn't that great of an idea. So yeah, if you want to like, if we, if you want to take it down and then uh, like like uh, download the code and put it up and then have it run over SSL, like yeah, sure. There's no like, there's no restrictions or. No, absolutely not. Right, absolutely. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty solid. Yeah, but like we're not gonna like include as like SSL certificates or anything because that would just be silly. Anyone else? Oh, you want like a store of challenges? Yeah. Um, so that seems to be pretty common. So uh, I guess email me. Uh, so everyone that's interested in that, email me at this link, and uh, I'll send you all like a list of challenges. And there's a ton of like, I know like Google has their own vulnerable web application. And there's a ton of other, excuse me, uh, there's a ton other app, uh, of applications that you can use that are vulnerable, that uh, old CTF challenges that you can look. Uh, look at so yeah, just email me and I'll send you a link of those and I'll put I'll add a slide or something when I post these about that. Oh yeah, so there is there is file there's related file uploading. So another really important part of RTFN is uh, a lot of times uh, if you're competing in an, uh, a capture the flag competition that's in Russia, say like the RUCTF, and you have to download a binary, um, it takes a long time to download because it's so far away and they might not have the best infrastructure. So it doesn't pay for everyone that wants to participate in that challenge to uh, download it. So there is, you can do related file uploading in Etherpad. So you can, if you have like a Nessus scan or you have a binary or you have a, like a bunch of files that you want to upload that are related to the challenge, you can upload those in Etherpad. Does it parse and display it? No, right now, no. I mean, if if that's something that you think would be useful, then like, yeah, we can look into it. But yeah, we're on SourceForge. Yeah, so if you want to like download that and you think you have a good idea and you want to instrument it yourself, be my guest. Absolutely. Yeah. So, a, like, a big part of this is collaboration, right? So, CTFs propagate collaboration, and it's not just like we're the only ones that like participate in CTFs. So if you guys ever have any ideas, I'm sure like a bunch of you guys have better ideas than us. I know I'm not really that creative. So uh, if you have any like cool ideas and you want to instrument them in the software, then awesome. Like that'd be sweet. Or if you don't have time, email us and hopefully we'll have time. It's all it's all PHP and JavaScript. Yeah, so it's it's not like Nessus where it's all Flash or anything. We're we're super 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 secure. Yeah. Commonly, like, I mean, you can go to like MITRE and like look at CVEs, but uh, as far as like, like, if you're looking for links on like system administration, like, I can like look look through those with you. You competed in Northeastern CCDC yeah. last year. Yeah. What team were you? Uh, Northeastern. Right, I was on the Stevens team. Yeah, I, I recognize you. But uh, yeah, I mean, like, especially competitions like CCDC. Like walking into CCDC is like walking like off a cliff while your pants are on backwards and you're on fire. Like there's nothing you can really do to prepare for that except like just know the systems that you're that you're supposed to defend. So just knowing what should be there and what shouldn't be there is like the best you can do. And just like just know what you're doing, I guess. Anyone? All right, sweet. So that went faster than I thought it did, sorry. Um, now you can all go grab a sweet cup of coffee. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around here for the rest of the afternoon. Feel free to ask me any questions.
Yeah, sure. Um, I have a plane at four, so I'll be around until like two.